Hello everyone, um, happy book club Friday. Quickly before we get into it, I want to talk about this week's uninvited guest, which is my cast. Um, I actually broke my wrist yesterday. I was in a little bit of an accident. Thankfully, I am okay. Everyone is okay. Um, and this is the worst of the injuries, so I feel very grateful. And I'm not going to let it stop me from talking about this week's book, um, but it is going to be joining us for the next couple of book clubs. So just get acquainted right now. Uh, anyways, this week's book was Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. It was my first time reading this book, although my mom has been trying to get me to read this book for a very long time, and I've had it forever, so I'm actually very grateful that I got the chance to finally read it, and um, I loved it. For those of you who haven't read it um, or just want a refresher, basically, without giving it away, because I do really think this is an important book for everyone to read, but without giving it away. It's about a young girl actually whose name I think is pronounced Kaya. It's spelled K-Y-A. Um, I was saying it Kaya the entire time I was reading it. Um, and it's about this girl who grows up in the Outer Banks, um, kind of in the marsh. And, you know, gradually as she's growing up, her family leaves her kind of one by one. So she's left on her own from a very young age, I think like nine years old. So she's kind of left to raise herself along with nature and kind of the role that nature plays in her upbringing, um, the independence that she gained from having to raise herself and sort of this idea of nature versus nurture, but actually that nature was her nurturer um, and her self-reliance and independence that she got from raising herself. Um, it is a really incredible book with a lot of amazing quotes and I think a lot of really great lessons. Um, I wanted to read some quotes. I saved some of the good quotes for my mom, so don't worry mom, but um, these are some of my favorites that I pulled when reading it. Um, one of them is, I must let go now, let you go. Love is too often the answer for staying, too seldom the reason for going. I drop the line and watch you drift away. Now, that's a powerful quote, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but I think it's so important to acknowledge that when you love someone so much, sometimes you tolerate things that you wouldn't normally, um, you allow them to treat you a certain way because you love them. But it's also important to understand that sometimes because you love someone, you have to let them go, especially if they aren't treating you the way that you deserve to be treated. Um, and love does not excuse that kind of behavior. Um, and I think, you know, that's part of the reason that Kaya's mom originally leaves her. Uh, Kaya in the book, not me, Kaya. <laughs> My mom is downstairs, but um, that might get a bit confusing. Maybe we have to find a nickname or something. Just, I don't refer to myself in third person. So when I say Kaya, I'm talking about the book, obviously. Um, another quote I loved is, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Now, I think that is a testament to kind of where you grew up. Um, I grew up on the beach in nature, and I think if I didn't have that playing role in my life, I'd be really sad, and I definitely notice it. Um, like, when I'm in New York, I feel like I'm missing a part of myself when I'm not in nature, and I think Kaya kind of feels the same way, that when she isn't in the marsh, she feels very out of place, and nature really is where she feels the most held, and um, the thing she relies the most on, the only thing she's been able to rely on in her life, really. So um, it's that kind of constant. It's the one constant in her life. And I think like making nature a constant in your life is uh, really important, especially at a time like this. Another one is time ensures children never know their parents young. Um, and that's a great segue into introducing the guest. But I do think, you know, by the time we have parents, like we look to them to teach us lessons that they have already learned and we almost tend to forget that they were once our age you know it took me really until this year to kind of like actually see my mom in moments as she was when she was my age and kind of understand she's been through a lot of the same things but it's like we place our parents on these pedestals because we don't know them when they're our age um it's impossible so now I want to just precursor, my mom is really the reason that I read. She has read every day 
for my whole life since I can remember. Um, she is my reading inspiration. She has always been recommending me some of my favorite books um, came from her and I think like when I really started reading as much as she did we started bonding in a new way and it opened our conversations up to so many interesting topics that maybe wouldn't have come up naturally just based on the way that we live so it's been a really interesting way for us to discuss topics that maybe we haven't experienced um, but kind of like place our opinions and I feel bad for everyone around us because when we're reading the same book the conversation is really only ever about that book where um, we both get very, very invested in the books that we're reading. I remember when we both read A Little Life, like for the next week, we were both in mourning, kind of walking around like so sad. <laughs> but it was nice to have someone to experience these emotions with. And I think that's what's so cool about doing a book club like this is like you get to experience um, these emotions and these feelings and um, sort of everything that goes along with reading a book with someone. So that's why I'm really grateful to have my mom here because I was, you know, we read this book at the same time and, you know, I was able to like run downstairs in the morning and be like, oh, I can't believe this happened or why did he do this? And she had already read the book, so she was familiar with the book, but she didn't want to give it away for me. So she was really good about that. But let's bring her on. I'm going to do everything left handed. So, you know, it could take a while. Uh, I'm learning how to be ambidextrous. So let's. further ado we're bringing on the woman who raised me my mom I think I'm there hi mom so we are talking to you when I know you're literally <laughs> above me I know I was I think it's kind of fun to have a split screen like this and it's cropping out my cast so okay good thanks good. for joining us oh no club. I'm so excited for you because you've wanted a book club for so long <laughs> but your life didn't really permit it and I remember you used to think like if I went to book club, it was just about moms getting together, drinking wine. So I actually brought a glass just to, <laughs> as a nod to that. I have my water. Okay, good girl. <laughs> but um, it is fun to read together. And I think that's something that I'm really grateful that you put, picked up on. Yeah, well, thank you for introducing me to the wonderful yeah. world of reading. Because I know I used to make fun of you for referencing the books that you were reading. Oh, I know. And look at me now. Well, I think it's funny because you and dad and Presley used to tease me so much whenever I would say like, oh my gosh, in this book I'm reading and now <laughs> I catch you doing it. I know, I'm you. Um, and you're carrying around a Kindle. I've converted you to Kindle. <laughs> Mom, don't expose me. <laughs> it is true though, because I used to always um, give you shit for reading on a Kindle because I love books so much. But it's true because when you're like lugging 10 books through the airport, it stops being about aesthetics and you're just like, you know what I need. Kindle. Well, especially right now. Oh, we're we're paused. I think I took the room with the good Wi-Fi. Maybe we'll get her back. <laughs> uh oh. House, so um she can always pop in she knows where i sleep uh yeah so we're, we're within range let me see if she re-requested though anyways yes i do read on a kindle thank you mom for exposing me that is um very kind of you. <laughs> let's bring her back on Hi. If we get cut off again, I'll just come up to your room. That's what I said. I was like, you know what? We're in the same house, so okay. I'm not that worried about it. I will do that if we get cut off again. I took the room with the good Wi-Fi, so um, I apologize. Wow. Um, but let's let's get into it. Okay. Sally, I'm going to interview you really quick. Um, so why did you love this book when you first read it? Well, first of all, how old were you when you first read this book? I read it not that long ago, a few years ago, when oh. Reese Witherspoon actually had it in her book club and I read it and I loved it. And of course I thought of you because, I mean, as soon as I saw the character's name, I was like, okay, Kaya has to read this book. 
And I, and I loved the story and I loved the book. And I thought it's a good story for a young woman because it's really a coming of age story mm -hmm. um, on, under unusual circumstances. Um, obviously that Kaya's life is very different than most young women's. Um, but I just lo I loved it and I loved the writing. Yeah, the writing. It is very poetic, I think, the way that she writes. And what made you want me to, because I remember when I first started reading, I had asked you for recommendations, and this was one of the first books that you had told me to read. Mm -hmm. So why this book? Well, I just thought you would enjoy it. And I think that's the main thing to get people to love reading is, mm -hmm. is finding stories that capture their imagination. And I feel like this story has everything. It has a yeah. mystery, it has a romance, it has, um, you know, this beautiful writing, you know, you talked about it being poetic. And one of the quotes that I wrote down in the very beginning was that autumn leaves don't fall, they fly. Mm -hmm. And when an author can, can give you that kind of picture. Yeah. Um, it just, and in the middle of a page, you know, she doesn't make a big deal out of it. So, right. And, and I think especially in this time, I just want not like total like candy escapism, but I want, if I'm going to read a book, I, you know, we're all home and we're lucky we're together and, you know, we live in Malibu and it's beautiful, but you know, it's a strange time for all of us to be mm -hmm. alive and living and figuring out what this new normal looks like. So to have a book that transports me to, mm -hmm. you know, or I learned something and I felt like this book did everything for me. Yeah, when you're, it's like you're playing the movie in your mind as you're reading it. And it is rare actually to get a book that does that. So I was really grateful. Like, I felt like when I was reading this book, I was like seeing everything as it happened, which is right. a really incredible way of writing it. Yeah, and I just thought um, also the relationship well, and really it wasn't a relationship because her mother leaves when she's so young, but it's mm -hmm. this longing, this primal kind of longing that um, not, not just a daughter, but a child has for their mother. And yeah. so much of that Kaya's life is about coming to terms with the fact that her mother left her. Yeah, I, I can read the quote, which is, um, within all the worlds of biology, she searched for an explanation of why a mother would leave her offspring. And it's like, even though she was too young to understand, she still knew it wasn't right to not have your mom there. And or that it was unnatural. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, completely. And I think, yeah, this like longing, I, I don't know what, there's just times like when I'm sad, the, my instinct is just like, I want my mom. And I think a lot of people feel that way. So it's kind of like her sort of trying to come to terms and also raise herself. You know, there's like so many questions that I came to you with while I was growing up and I still have questions for you every day about things and I think that absence is it weighs so heavy especially on a young woman as she's you know maturing well and she literally had no one she yeah. didn't have her eventually everyone in her family kind of peeled off mm -hmm. she didn't have teachers because when she went to school she was made to feel like an outcast and she was she was mm -hmm. you know, a young girl living by the marsh in herself Mm -hmm. And and this is one of the things that we talked about when we were reading it is how the marsh, um, that that is actually a character in this book, yeah, and becomes her mother, her father, her lover, her friend. It absorbs her pain, and the it, it doesn't it make you want to go there and like mm -hmm. go for two weeks. Like that's that's the beauty Absolutely. of the marsh. Yeah, it's that it can kind of relieve her temporarily at least at these moments of feeling really alone which is completely natural when your whole family is gone and I think she's nine when she's left on her own and yeah. just the way that she sort of starts to educate herself and also I think we should talk a bit about yeah. Tate um who well, is her sort of teacher yes um and like her first love and I really liked the Tate character except for when he ditches her when he goes to school and so first before we actually talk about Tate I just want to okay. ask like, why do you think Tate ditched her well I that as I was reading it and knowing that we were going to have this book club about it I wrote down that as a question um but then obviously it you ex he does explain it in the end which is Tate is you know sh she is of the marsh she she never fits in 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 you know civilization nor does she want to eventually because yeah. because she's been rejected again and again and 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 i wrote down that the hypocrisy of when she goes to town 
wants like, you know, to get groceries. And mm -hmm. she's dirty because she lives in a shack in the marsh. Mm -hmm. And the preacher's wife, like pulls her children away from her and calls her dirty. And just, you know, when you're rejected by something again and again, Eventually, Especially someone who you expect to hold you, like God loves all of his children. And right. you think that this is a big part of their community that makes a lot of people feel included and even they are rejecting her. Right. So I think that her connection with Tate, really, it starts off as they both, you know, he's had his loss as well. And they he lost his mother, right? And sister, I think, in a and car. Sister, yes. Yeah. So they both have this, they both look to nature for comfort and and really to make sense of the world i mean the, that's the thing like she and and you refer to this in the beginning about the quote when she's looking to nature for looking any time where a mother in nature leaves her young and there really isn't any but that's how she figures stuff out and i think that tate has that same relationship with nature and you know eventually he makes it his career and his job mm -hmm. so and that's so does she really right but mm -hmm. in the beginning, I think it's really innocent that they're like kindred spirits just connecting in their love mm -hmm. of nature. And I think he also like is really her only last connection with her family yeah. um, because he was friends with her brother, Jody, who she was the closest with, I think, and she eventually reconnects with. So I think her having that sort of like last connection with her family, that last tie and, you know, he offers to protect and take care of her. And he sort of has this like nurturing instinct about him that maybe is because he lost his mom. And so he took on that sort of nurturing role in his family. But I feel like he plays like a big role in teaching her and helping her grow up and, you know, looking out for her. He, I think there's a quote about like him having this like brotherly protective instinct mm -hmm. over her, but also loving her and wanting to be with her. I'm well, I think it starts out, I mean, look, they, they've known each other since they were kids. So obviously it starts out as just this super innocent relationship and a love of fishing and, you know, mm -hmm. the marsh. And then he teaches her how to read. And he is protective of her because at that point, their age difference seems much greater. If she's yeah. 15 and he's 19, you know, that's a bigger age difference than when she's 20 and he's 24, right? Mm -hmm. As I always tell you. I know. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think that their relationship unfolds in a really natural way mm -hmm. though. And I think he's very protective of her th throughout the whole thing, except for when, as you started to say, he goes off to college, he promises he's going to come back as much as he can. And mm -hmm. then the very first chance he has to come back, he doesn't see her. And I think, you know, I think part of it is because he cares so much about her he couldn't say bye. Like he couldn't bring himself to break up with her, which I think is selfish, but it is also, I think that's when the maturing of men and women, women start to kind of show because those four years suddenly seem like nothing. And it's almost like she's more emotionally mature because she's expecting at least a goodbye. Right. And he doesn't even give her the sort of, explanation as he just stops coming by and she already has these abandonment issues and that's why I think it hurt so much to read that part was because she was already struggling with abandonment issues and the one person who she thought was going to stick around didn't right it wasn't like he didn't know that she had those issues yeah. he knew and still didn't have the nerve to come back and say you know because he was he had his own inner turmoil about like how can I be with this woman that can't like how do I fit these pieces together? Mm -hmm. oh, and, he, and he eventually evolves and, and comes to an understanding. But, you know, and a lot of them, they all had to go through a lot of pain to get there. Yeah. Um, and I think my favorite quote about Tate is um, sort of what his dad taught him. It says, his dad had told him many times that the definition of a real man is one who cries without shame, reads poetry with his heart, feels opera in his soul, and does what's necessary to defend a woman. Right. And that's really who you want Tate to be. And he is mm -hmm. most of the book, but then he has that, you know, know, he disappoints us, which also, you know, is a great thing in books. It's harder in real life, but it's, in, in, it's important. Like no one is 100% good or 100%. Mm -hmm. bad. I mean, those characters tend to be very two dimensional. And like, yeah. I think that's what made Tate, if Tate was just the perfect guy, we probably wouldn't even like him that much. 
Because, yeah, it, it makes him an unbelievable character. Right. And you don't get as attached. Like, I think the fact that he learned from his mistakes, he worked to get forgiven. She did eventually forgive him. And that, like, worked. It makes you appreciate their love story a lot more, I think. Um, what did you think about um, her relationship with Chase? Now, Chase is interesting. I think... You know, I think it's difficult when you're learning. Basically, she had to learn everything the hard way because she didn't have anyone to, to teach her except the Marsh. So, you know, things like that, I think with Chase, she was sort of realized after Tate, like, I can't rely on anyone. So I'm not going to expect to rely on this person, but I'm actually getting attention and it feels good. And um, I'm just going to try it out. Now, I think Chase is a little bit different because I think he was a little bit pushier with her, which I didn't respond well to. And I remember her mom told her when she was younger, if you look tempting, men turn to predators. And now if that's an idea that's embedded in your head, I think it can be very toxic for young girls because it leads them to this idea of, oh, I might have been asking for it. Right. And I how think Chase sort of was gaslighting her a little bit. And I did not. How like much, and I think we both underlined this quote, that she laughed for his sake, something she'd never done. Giving away another piece of herself just to have someone else. I mean, yeah. you, even though I think she knew Chase wasn't, I, and I don't think she ever really thought he was like, the guy but she was so lonely and it was just this idea of wh what do you trade um and i think that was another quote yeah. how much do you trade to de to defeat lonesomeness and how yeah. much you know do you settle just because you don't want to be alone which is something as a mother again like i you know we like i would counsel you don't you don't need to do that you know it's you'd rather be alone than, mm -hmm. than in a bad relationship or lonely in a relationship, which happens. Yeah, which I think she started, especially towards the end, feeling very neglected by him because, you know, he's promising her all of these things, marriage and a life. And she, even for a second, thinks, oh, I can fit into this world. And then soon comes to realize it wasn't the reality and he wasn't planning to marry her. And, um, you know, it's again, it's like she just constantly keeps getting let down by people. And right. I think that's why she starts getting, she starts getting super self-reliant because she realizes, and I think there was a quote about, you know, when you rely on people, leaning on people, you just fall. Yeah. Because she's on the ground. Falling. Yeah. The only, the only thing that was the constantly there for her was nature. It was the birds, mm -hmm. big red. And mm -hmm. um, even when she ends up in jail at the end, and again, we don't want to give it away for people who haven't read it. But this, like I said, this book has everything. It has like, you know, courtroom yeah. suspense. And, um, but when she's in jail and the cat comes, and you know, cats are normally aloof and they're not, super, you know, they can kind of come and go as they want, but the cat just kind of looks around and jumps in her lap. And there's, she says something about such an easy acceptance. And it's just a deep pause in a lifetime of longing. And I think she had this longing for connection, but obviously didn't have um, even a good example of what connection should look like. Yeah. And the only place that she got, other than um, Jump In and his wife, Mabel, mm -hmm. who were in a way her surrogate parents. But yeah, they looked out for her. As, as much as they could. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think she, she sort of like, how they were treated in the town they felt like outcasts and you know they experienced racism and she experienced a sort of prejudice against her as well for being an outsider and so i think for her finding people like jumpin and mabel um that she could relate to and and um connect to i think that was like they played a really important role in her life right. and i think you know some of the issues and this really shows in her relationship with chase is because her example of a relationship when she was young was a really toxic and violent one between mm -hmm. her mother and father her father would beat up her mother and even beat up her siblings and her and i think you know when that's your example of love and she was too young at the time to understand why her mom left her father but she saw what was happening so i think she tolerated this sort of bad behavior from chase because that was her example of love but when i think she reached the breaking point like her mother did when she left she says she understands finally why her mom left her dad. Yes, like 
living through that herself gave her compassion and empathy for her mom. And, you know, she only had examples of human beings letting her down and leaving her and disappointing her. And, and normally it was because they left. Mm -hmm. But then when Jumpin' dies, mm -hmm. it's the first time she experiences loss without being left. I mean, mm -hmm. he just passed. So she had, and I think that also was another layer of her healing and toward forgiving her mom and just understanding mm -hmm. that not all loss um, is like someone choosing to leave you. Mm -hmm. And that I think it was she was finally old enough because, you know, it took her a long time to process people leaving her and why yeah. the sort of idea of why. And I think when you're young and this keeps happening, you can start to blame yourself and think, well, it must be me. What's the one common denominator? And, um, I think by the time jump in passes, she realizes that not it's not her fault and she can move on from it and she can grieve. And I think it allowed her to also grieve the people that walked away from her in the past because by the time she found out her mom had died, it was two years after she had died and she had already been gone for so long that she couldn't believe, but it was like every time she walked out of her house, she looked for her mom. And yeah. I think that was what was heartbreaking breaking for me was, kind of feeling throughout the whole book this tone this undertone of her just waiting for her mom to come back yeah and just the way she any any little scrap or remnant of her mother like even when she finally has money and can fix up her shack that she still wants the kitchen and the table like certain mm -hmm. things that remind her of her mother or the the food that she cooks the hush puppies mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. how that's how she holds on to her mom through memories. And I think that that's really true, even for a lot of us. I mean, you know, some of our traditions that we do yeah. at Christmas or whatever, it's because my grandmother used to make that or my mother used to make that. And those things are really like, I think beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the food that my mom used to make, I don't even like anymore, but I'll still <laughs> make it because it reminds me of being a kid and that feeling of being a kid with the love of a mother. And I think that, yeah. you know, that she was yearning for that and, and the way she found it connected were through those little things. Yeah, I think her, especially cooking came a lot from her mom. And I just think, you know, even when I started being more independent and like cooking for myself and doing all that stuff, like I was constantly trying to find ways to bring you back into it because you do, <laughs> subconsciously pick up on so many things that even when I talk to people they say you know you have the same mannerisms as your mom mm -hmm. and I don't even notice it but I think subconsciously like we look to our mothers for so much um and you know even though she was I think six when her mom left mm -hmm. she still carried her throughout her entire life Yes, and as a role model. I think what's interesting, and this is not really about the book, but since we're talking about mother-daughter relationships and just in general, like you are at that age where, you know, you're totally pretty much launched. You're very independent. But then yesterday you broke your wrist, you have a cast, and all of a sudden you need help doing everything. I know, and I feel a bit like Kaya because I've always like really prided myself on being very independent and doing everything by myself. Um, and to have to ask for help is a new thing for me. But I also sure. think that being vulnerable in that way, and I think that's where Kaya had trouble with Tate, right? Because she had trouble asking or saying what she wanted, which is a theme in some of the other books, like Normal People, that you've mm -hmm. read too, right? Where people are afraid to say what they want. But, you know, Kaya eventually gets there. And like for you today, just asking me to help you like chop up a cucumber because <laughs> you can't do it. Um, <laughs> Or like tie my dress for me. <laughs> right. But being able to, like, I think that's part of maturity is understanding that vulnerability and asking people for help does not mean weakness. And I know that better myself. There's a trust there that, you know, that is a, a beautiful balance about relationships. Yeah. You know? I think being able to let people in and you know understand that not every bad experience dictates the rest of your life mm -hmm. and i think that's why kaya was so strong at the end because she really did in so many ways the world was against her and proved to her over and over again you know 
stay isolated because the only thing that you're going to be able to rely on, the only thing that's going to catch you is the nature and the ground beneath you. And yes. for her to be able to overcome that, you know, deep rooted trauma of her family leaving her, of people being against her, of being bullied out of school and um, being able to finally like trust someone and be vulnerable and open with someone and um, end up with someone that is a that is a big I think nature versus nurture because she it shows that you can overcome and that's things. why I suggested this book to you and I'm glad you read it and I'm glad you got the message from it because it, it is it's like a very um, you know empowered in the end you know she's always independent but just being independent isn't everything, right? Like you, mm -hmm. it's this balance between being independent, but also being vulnerable. And then in, when she finally gets there and accept, learns to accept love, then she's a whole person. She's mm -hmm. a whole person. Yeah. Well, thank you for recommending this book to me welcome. and for being on. You know, you're always welcome as a guest <laughs> on my book club. I know you're basically like, I will say, you have been one of the most constant supporters of this book club you ask very good questions on here i appreciate Thank your you. i can always be your your like um you know plan b on here like it's you're never plan so b by the way i don't think that <laughs> it's I was okay like, I, oh who can i ask i kind of felt like it was this time but it's it was <laughs> <laughs> you're never a plan b um but i know you're very busy and you oh, have yeah. lots of reading on your agenda so i didn't want to you know, mess up your reading schedule. But um, thank you for doing this and for having a really great conversation. It was my pleasure. Love you. Love I will see you very shortly. Okay. <laughs> I love Bye. you. Bye. Oh, well, um, now you guys get to see how uh, we could go on forever, my mom and I, because truly, we talk about books probably more than anything else. Even if we're watching like a TV show together, we we'll sit down and really dissect it. Um, and that's what I love about our relationship, how it's evolved. And it breaks my heart that Kaya never got to evolve her relationship with her mom. Uh, so I feel very, very fortunate to have that kind of relationship with my mother. Um, thank you again, mom, for doing this from another room in the house. Um, and thank you guys for watching. We have a really great book next week that I will announce tomorrow. Um, and me and my cast will be there with more thoughts and ideas with another special guest. So thank you guys for tuning in. Have a really wonderful Friday and please stay safe out there. Bye.